What is up, Mets fans? Welcome to a very special and international episode of the Mets Up Podcast. And it is such an exciting one because the Mets, I mean, I almost want a tomahawk chop on them right now. The Braves, the mighty Atlanta Braves go down in a three-game series. Could have been four, but we got three because of some rain. You know what? Fuck them. Fuck the Braves. We took two out of three. The Mets haven't been playing particularly great baseball, but they came into Atlanta and they won a bunch of games, looked really good, had a great comeback victory in game one. Game two fought back. Game three beat the living shit out of them. It was fantastic. James, you're in Morocco. How you feeling out in uh, the continent of Africa? This is the first messed up episode done on African soil. This is the first messed up episode on African soil. I'm also the first member of the Shiano clan to ever make it to African soil. Wow. So it's very nice. Morocco has been a, it's a crazy place. It's, it's really just insane. Like, I think you would like it because the two big things here are bartering and slow cooked meat, two great nice. things. It is also just, it's very chaotic. It's, it's a lot to handle. You know, I can handle a lot, but this is a lot. Like James, pick- too, too much personal stuff. Don't, I don't yeah, want to hear right. about the meat. No more personal stuff. No more personal That's, stuff. The time's up. It is funny though, because like you guys talk shit sometimes about the personal stuff. We do it like forty five seconds at the beginning of every episode, and also just like Mark and I are friends. Like we haven't seen each other in like <laughs> a week, up. two weeks. Yeah, we're like we gotta talk a little bit. We're both on the way. But I rode ATVs today. I saw a crazy waterfall. I'm seeing so many weird ass animals. Like it's it's been a fun time. But all the while, and these long bus rides, I'm taking these excursions, loading up some Mets games, watching them all I can. It was such a fun watch back of this series. Like absolutely capitalizing on it today, being on a hot steaming bus, watching the game cast, one nothing Mets. Three nothing Mets, five nothing Mets, and at the end of the sixteen four Mets, I'm like, I, I can't believe this is happening. But we're now looking at a week in a row where the Mets are playing well, and they've taken down two teams who a lot of people expected to possibly be playoff teams in the National League. I'm being a little generous, the Cincinnati Reds, but the Braves are the Braves are the Braves. The Braves are the class of baseball, and I know it's April, and a lot of people are going to make fun of the Mets for you know celebrating another April World Series, but. I don't know the way this team felt a week ago, the way we felt a week ago, the way you guys probably felt a week ago to go into Atlanta and legitimately curb stomp the team that usually sometimes has curb stomped us feels incredible. Yeah, it feels good that we did not get the living shit kicked out of us. I thought for sure this was going to be an ugly series. Like when I saw Cole Sulcer hit the mound in game one, I was like, what in the world is going on here? Like, how are we going to be able to win this game? How are the Mets going to keep this close? I was, like, not necessarily happy with the decisions that Mendoza was making. Now, I understand that Rayleigh, Adovino, Diaz were not available. They pitched three out of four days. That's fine. But it was like, how so early on in the season, every year, do the Mets seemingly have these bullpen issues where there's not enough arms? But shout out to Reed Garrett. Shout out to Cole Salser. Shout out to the bullpen who really stepped up the series and did a great job. Overall, like game, I mean, game one was such a game that the Mets lose by a lot. And to come back and win that one in the fashion that they did, I'm here in Florida uh, with my dad and my cousin Ted, and we're, we were watching the game, and we're like, oh, man, like we were we were feeling down, we were feeling bad, this is going to go south, and then chipping away, chipping away, Brandon Nimmo, two home runs, DJ Stewart. We, I was, we were looking at the Mets lineup that night, and I'm like, why in the world is DJ Stewart – Hitting ahead of Jeff McNeil, I was like, I'd love to have Jeff up here rather than DJ. Not that Jeff's really hitting the ball particularly well, but just the idea that I think DJ Stewart coming into the game was 0 for 12 at that point before he hit that home run. So it just like things were clicking, things were going well, and to beat the Braves at home with that just such a good person, Marcelo Zuna, thinking that he hit the walk-off home run in the ninth inning. Oh, just, just beautiful. You couldn't have written it any better. Meek Phil had the tweet of the week because he was like, "Wow, it's such a it's such a crime." Like I think the ball was call, a strike was called against Marcel Zuna that he thought was a ball. Oh, but like, oh my god, yeah. such a crime! This pitch was called a strike against Marcel Zuna. Everyone Google Marcel Zuna crimes. <laughs> One of the <laughs> nice. One of it was a it was a bad call. It was a bad, bad call. But you know what? Couldn't happen to a worse person. Couldn't happen to a worse person. I also think a lot is being made of the fact that the Mets are kind of playing catch up with the bullpen every single day to start the year, and a lot of it, it does feel strange. But I think that. Some is being overblown by two things right now. One is the fact that the Mets did lose Kodai Sanga. Their only yeah. real, like, unquestioned starter that they had going into the season. I think a truck is driving past me right now. I'm doing the, the Morocco, Morocco podcast. Shout out Morocco. But, um, and the other thing is that, like, while we're not getting length from the starters, it's uncommon that the Mets just for these couple of weeks have 15 games in 14 days. That's not normal. The season's not going to be like that. We're going to have off days. We're going to have Mondays off. We're going to have Thursdays off. We're going to have starts once everyone gets ramped up. 
where Luis Severino is giving seven innings, where Adrian Hauser is giving seven innings, where Jose Quintana is giving seven innings. I know that Kodai Sang was moved now to the 60-day IL earlier this week, which again, official stance of the Messed Up Podcast, that's a non-story because he was never coming back in May anyway. So eventually maybe he comes back and he's giving you seven innings regularly. So it's a combination of the fact that we literally have more than one game on average per day for these two weeks that we're inside of right now. And we just haven't Really, we don't have a, a rotation that's ready to give length as of right now either. Not as one that I think won't give it. Also, not one that I think that's going to be their strength as season goes on. But I do think the fact that like these guys are unavailable isn't isn't like jumping off bridge stuff like some people are making that to be. I think it's just a bad series of coincidence that's kind of happening and amazing, amazing, amazing by Reed Garrett. It's literally, for twice in four days, put this team on his back and literally, Dog. weirdly, insanely win the Mets two games actually. Yeah, I mean, he kept it close in a game that so easily could have gotten out of hand. Like, I, I don't think we can understate. No, man, can I? Can, should I? Should I? Yeah. But how important game one for the Mets in Atlanta against the Braves to the win season. that? To, in of April. The, yeah, of the season in April to win it like that. But it really did completely change my whole feel of what, yeah, of what this team is going to be moving forward. Now, I'm going to say this. Still, calm the expectations. Even Keith, I think, thinks that in game three, he's like, Mets fans? Don't take too much stock in taking four or six on the road in April. Like, it's a long, long season. And I think we all need a little bit, bit of a heat check. And maybe the Royals are going to give us that, give us that this weekend. But because they are playing some really good baseball right now, my Royals. But too good to have that win in the way that they did, the comeback fashion, Nimmo just hitting the living piss out of the ball. DJ Stewart off the schneid. Jeff McNeil, Brett Beatty even getting some hits in these games on Jeff McNeil's birthday. A little happy birthday, Jeff McNeil. You know, Mets Twitter's always got that. It just felt like a good team win and almost could be one that you look back on maybe this year if things go right. Where like, this was when the Mets kind of took a break and like, oh, we're, we're a good team. We're not as bad as we had been playing to start the year because it was a nightmare start to the season. Yeah, hand up by both of us for that. We were pretty emotional the first few episodes of the season. Hand up by Mark and James. It was sad. Maybe we a were little upset. better. Yeah, a little better, a little emotional. It was weird being back in City Field, guys. You know, you, it's hard. To, it's hard to, to like, describe we're those spoiled. feelings. Yeah, we were spoiled, and then we felt strange and uncomfortable. But now we're back and feeling okay. And again, official stance of the Messed Up Podcast: is This is a seventy-five to eighty-five win baseball team. Yes. And now, after the last full week of games, we've gone back to what we expected. It was a weird roundabout way to get there, and that kind of might be a bit of um, like uh, what's what's like a bad nicer word for omen, like uh, equilibrium. Ah, what's the word like when you're starting a play? Neither of us are musical guys, but you know starting when they have the play and they first do act. Uh, no, the thing before that, the overture. The it's opener? like an over, oh. overture. It's like an overture for the season where you saw some music. highs and you saw some lows, mess, messed up musicals. But like you kind of saw a little taste of what the season might be like. Where it's gonna be some good moments, it's gonna be some bad moments. It's good, it's it like it's kind of wrong on us because we thought it would be like more of a hovering in the middle. We might just have a team with major extremes, and that's <laughs> that's not that not fun. I mean, listen. You got you got to love baseball to watch this team. That's where we were so a hundred percent right. It's like you got to love baseball. They're gonna win close games. They're gonna lose close games. They're gonna get the shit kicked out of them. I honestly, I'll say this: didn't expect to beat the Braves sixteen to four. That was not in the realm of possibilities for this card. team this season. But like you said, maybe that's why they're more of an extreme rather than the in the middle eighty one wins, eighty one losses type team. Like it might, it it could be a nightmare season. Still, I'm not counting that out. But this at least gives me hope now. Way more hope than I had after watching them just get the fucking shit kicked out of them by the Tigers and the Brewers. I also think that game one of the series was just like a fun baseball game. Like baseball. Great baseball. Like, oh, to watch one the be One of the play. games of the year, probably. Literally, it was just, there was a lot of contact. There were balls in the gap. There were two like lightning quick plays at home plate. One with Acuna, oh, yeah. one with Pete. Like I don't remember watching a game in recent memory, a Mets game, where within three innings of each other, there were two bang-bang plays at home plate. Like back-to-back. -back. It was amazing. And then just... I want to just now like like start to like really tear through this stuff a little bit and like talk yeah. about Reed Garrett specifically. What I'm going to tear through the most from the Mets in this series because like he he saved everything. Like it's I almost thought it was kind of like this beautiful like baseball gods thing where we realized the last episode the Mets could have sent him down after the long outing against um that was Tigers yeah that was Tigers that feels like a long Ooh, time. Oh, I had a I got a, a message from someone on Twitter. The reason Reed Garrett was not sent down was because if they were to have optioned him they would have had to have taken someone that was not on the 40 man because it was still that if you optioned guys down, you could oh, up a little Yeah, of course. Okay. That's why Reed Garrett stayed on. So, hey, hand up. We never should have doubted David Stearns. We never no, should have no. doubted him. He knows that what he's was, doing. That That's was our guy. Fault. Heat check. Heat check. <laughs> the president of baseball ops versus two dumbasses of the Mexican. Two podcast guys. Yeah. We'll, give it to the, we'll give it to the president of baseball operations. But 
Julio Tehran this game kind of did what every Mets fan was expecting, and now he's been DFA'd, which is weird. But I also think like he did look like he was really upset when he was giving up those runs in that game. It's a it savvy seemed- move though, too, because if a team picks up his like his DFA, like picks him off the waiver wire, they're paying the two point five million. So there is no risk in the Mets putting him or DFAing him in that sense. Yeah, I think I saw from Tim Healy on Twitter, and I think your boy John Becker as well. The Mets only are paying him somewhere between like fifty four and like seventy seven thousand dollars, which is amazing for one week of work, but also awesome. bizarre crazy but like, there was some things happening there like i remember that first step out of the game like kind of did set the tone by just going up and in the cooney early yes just jamming him up jamming him up being on his hands and then he had like a really good like you don't usually see this from the start in the first inning but you see it with a guy like julio tehran who's really wily but has no stuff where he just dropped a curveball matt olson first pitch to get a one on him and like that first time through the order you felt like good things were happening but then like second time around the order like ozuna hit the moonshot albies hit the gapper on official also was way off the plate got on obviously albies your boy for having another just <laughs> incredible quintessential Great series. Outcome. he's so good but then Rieger comes in. She's like two and a third innings pitched. One hit, one walk, five strikeouts. He had 12 whiffs in this game. That was the most in the whole game. Charlie Morton threw 105 pitches and he had fewer whiffs than Reed Garrett. It's incredible. And the crazy thing about Reed Garrett is that he did something that's like very new baseball in this game that like I feel like is kind of just becoming the modern baseball now where he just refused to throw any fastballs. He threw 34 pitches in this game. 28 of those were his sweeper, his splitter, or his slider. And only six of those were his fastball or his sinker. And that's how he was effective. He was throwing crazy movement stuff. The splitter was getting the lefties. The sweeper was getting the righties. The slider was mixing the balls. And the fastballs and the sinkers were kind of being used when they had to be used. And it was perfect. And it, it bridged the Mets to getting to, again, like Cole Sauls or Jake Diekman. Shout out Drew Smith. Still hasn't given up a run this year. Drew but- Got them to a point in the game where the bats came alive. They wound up taking the lead, and it was it was good enough to win. And it's just hats off to Reed Garrett. Yeah, shout out to Brandon Nimmo too. Really put the team on his back in this game. Just a blister in the ball all over the field. Brett Beatty, some more hits. Like guys, a ball. Brett Beatty's a little bit of a ball player here, fellas. Player. I mean, we're we're talking about someone now who at third base, he's he's better than Alec Bohm. We're getting there. <laughs> we're, we asked for Alec Bohm. He's better. He, he's a way better fielder. That's where it really is the difference. Offensively, they're the same. But yeah, yeah, right and, now they are. defensively, Brett Beatty is just looking phenomenal. He even made a play where, again, knocked it down, made a strong throw throughout. Yes. I think it was maybe Acuna or Albies. Like, no, no, no worry, no stress. He looks so comfortable this year, which is great. And hey, maybe that's the Mendoza effect. Maybe that he gave him the confidence, put, it like, put him in there. It's like, you're going to be our guy. You're playing third base. It totally looks like Brett Beatty knows he belongs there now. It's also a thought where we've heard so much about how he worked with Francisco Lindor. Bailey worked with Francisco Lindor through the offseason and spring training, especially get better at defense, positioning, being ready more so, which is funny, but it is. And I also think that like maybe just like spending so much time with Lindor. I know like Lindor is a divisive topic in Mets world Playing right now. about as bad as he possibly can right now. Has basically ever has. You gotta, everyone got a hit no on Thursday, including Lindor. But you think that maybe Bailey spending that time with Lindor and like learning from Lindor like the one thing about Lindor that's very infectious is the energy he plays with. And we're yes. seeing Brett Beatty play with so much more emotion, so much more energy. And it's not like out of check emotion. It's not out of check energy. It's just like looking like he exactly. really lo- 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 loves playing baseball again. Like you, I-, I just tweeted out right before the podcast started where they did the infield huddle at the end of the Thursday game and he humped everybody. And like nice. he was like screaming when he jumped up and caught the, the ball Thursday afternoon too. Where it's just like nice. And like there was a play – on this DJ Stewart home run where he's oh, he's running second base. Nuts. He was going crazy on third base, like hyping up the dugout. And it's like, this is, we talked about this months ago where I don't remember who we were talking to. It might have been with Tim Healy. It might have been even before. It might have still been the bad time for the podcast. But just the fact that when you have a team that you hope to exceed expectations, you want to mix veterans and youth because you want the youth to inject energy. And we've yep. seen this with Francisco Alvarez. And now we're seeing with Brett Bader, where these two guys are just young, dumb, and full of you-know-what, and they're just having a really good time playing baseball. And like It seems like everyone's kind of feeding off it, which is beautiful. Yeah, no, I mean, it's really good. And the fact that Ronald Acuna still has, I believe, no barrels on the season, <sighs> zero barrels, Mets didn't give up one. He did pretty much nothing this series. Uh, he stole, oh, I know he stole bases in game two, but that, like, that's fine, whatever. He's going to steal bases. Cool, you know what? One win from the Braves. One win out of three games against the Mets, the lowly New York Mets, the LOL Mets, who everyone was talking trash about. Maybe ourselves included. Maybe we were a little bit down on them as well. But, hey, you know what? Glad to be wrong. Glad to be on the wrong side of history here. And The Mets take two of three. Game two, of course, was going to be the quick one I think we talk about. Adrian yeah. Hauser just, just got hit by the Braves when he's not able to pick off corners and have the command that he needs. This is what's going to happen. It's also the Braves lineup is disgusting. Like, it's insane. End of the day, we're having fun making fun of the Braves, but we know that this is the best lineup in baseball, right? Top to bottom. 
and the, uh, the Rangers give them a run for their money, but I still probably would take the Braves. You aren't wrong about that, but it's just like it never ends. Like even Michael Harris hitting seventh. Like why is Michael Harris still hitting seventh? Michael Harris is so good. He's it's incredible. He is so good. <laughs> Like he, even even the game where the Braves got manhandled on Thursday, everybody in the lineup had a hit except for Ronald Acuna and, and Orlando Arcia, which is crazy to think about. But like he, again, even the game sixteen four, they get manhandled on Thursday. Ozzy Albies has three hard at balls. Austin Riley has three hard at balls. Every single person in the lineup, including Forrest Wall, who got one at bat because the Braves were getting pistol whipped so badly, pitch for Ronald Acuna, even hit the ball hard. Like it's just like they just don't stop. But but Hauser in that game, like we did. Warren Mets fans, I think it's just when you watch him, you can feel it. Play because he's a bad team. He's fun to watch. He's working corners. He's manipulating the zone. A little cutter, a little sinker, a little slider. The Rockies this year. <laughs> at home, at home, at home. Yes, at home. Not there, not there. But like Acuna got that stolen base off off him right at the beginning of the game, and it's just you can feel like everybody was like, "Oh, this game isn't going to go that well." And they just this was the game of the Braves. Are like they got pissed off. They lost that game barely on Monday. They were like, "We're going to do something to you." But again. Nice to see the Mets fight all the way back in this game. Really get to the last step out of the game. Getting around the lineup. Pete hitting the home run. Francis Lindor getting on base to give Pete one more chance to win it. Like there was, there was more energy at the end of this game than there had been. I feel like in the previous games this season, it felt like something good. But something we want to yes. talk about is the Starling Marte hitting second experiment. Hopefully, it's an experiment. Hopefully, it's over. I know they just scored sixteen runs, but that's not because Starling Marte is hitting second. The Starling Marte hitting second experiment almost was detrimental on uh, in game two on Wednesday Tuesday. because Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday. Oh, yeah, Tuesday. Because he came up in the ninth inning with one out. Harrison Bader was on third. He ended up driving in the run on a ground out to second base, which is fine, whatever. You know, keep going. It's okay. But the idea is that that should be Lindor and then the next batter should be Alonzo. And you could almost see in the world where – it goes the wrong way, and Pete Alonso never even gets to the plate in that. Yeah. And you would be like, oh, so this is why hitting Starling Marte second is stupid, because in this exact moment, this is exactly why we talk about why we want the top th best three hitters hitting one, two, three in this lineup, because you get the most at-bats. And there was almost a world where Starling Marte got an at-bat and Pete Alonso didn't, and that could have been the difference between a win and a loss. Granted, we still lost the game, but it's just, again, the process of – understanding lineup construction and i'm wondering if mendoza makes the lineup if the G if stearns is involved in the lineup i don't we kind of know last year it's a little more on the manager than you most people think yeah i think also just the way the lineup has been changing so much and shifting that seems to me obvious that it's like a first-time manager who's kind of manipulating things kind of like maybe squeezing squeezing a little too tight right now being a little bit lenny with the rabbits because it's just like every day there's different guys in different spots like now Bates ahead of alvarez before alvarez alvarez ahead of Beatty. now marte was six now marte is two and like pete was three now pete is four it's like every single day these little these little tiny tweaks i feel like you're doing when you're trying to do too much before before we close the book on game two just shout out harrison Bader for trying to stretch that single into a double that was that was unbelievable. That was he. It was it was right in front of him. I can't believe he did that. I was shocked the whole way, and then I was shocked at how shocked he was that he somehow didn't make it second base safely. It's just shout out you, Harrison Bader. You are, you're one of a kind. But it's been it's been fun, yeah, fun getting to know. It's been fun getting to know you these last few weeks. Yeah, that's how I would describe Harrison Bader. He is one of a, he's a one of a kind baseball player that I haven't seen too often at the major league level. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely not. But I mean, hey, like that was a game where the Mets lost, but you also didn't feel that bad about losing it. And then we move on to past the rain out to Thursday. I love that they made this a three game series instead of a four oh, game loved series. It, loved it. Because now we had a chance to win the series and we fucking won the series. We did. Like the Mets won a series. And it's funny, like all this shit, all the way back around 2022, we went back to the old recipe of success where you win game one, you lose game two, you win game three. <laughs> yes. We're, we're back in the rhythm. We're back. We're doing a little it's dance good. again. And it all started in this game again. Again, we keep saying it. it starts with Brett Beatty because the Mets are challenging in the first inning and there's two outs, man in scoring position, Brett Beatty at the plate. And he gets down to a quick 0 2 on Alan Winnens, who, I mean, Alan Winnens. I'm not, I'm not going to be. To pretend that you guys are very impressed with Alan Winnens, but sucks. He, he, yeah, I don't think he's very good. But you're down 0-2 quickly. And there were so many times I feel like last season where Brett Bader would quickly go down 0-2 and then the, the, the at bat would feel totally over. He would make a bad decision and it would be shot. But in this at bat, Brett Bader takes an outside pitch, drives it the other way, lays it out there, gets the RBI single. And now you're like, oh, nice. And it was a bad, mostly because it was a bad pitch by Winnens. I think he was trying to go super upstairs with a fastball. He just threw one middle high, slightly high and outside. But it's Brett Bay not trying to do too much, not being obsessed with pulling the ball. Like we, he is pulling the ball more this year, and he's lifting the ball. There's some probably some regression coming for Brett Bay. I don't think he's going to end the season with a 450 BABIP no. and keep it. But I also don't think he's going to keep his hard hit rate down like the 20 percent out of the league. Like I think there's going to be like an evening out of he's going to make better contact, but then probably start like not getting as many of these seeing eye singles. But this one's just he took a fastball, did what he had to do with it, and that game being one nothing, I feel like kind of was like the shot of confidence the Mets needed. And then from there, the floodgates opened, and we just fucking rolled.
Yeah, totally. I was I was on the golf course, shot an eighty nine today. Great round for Jesus. me. Great, great round, eighty nine. I I almost I almost shot under forty on the front nine. I was five over. Crazy. But uh yeah, great, great round of golf. Watching like getting getting the highlights, getting the clips, getting like the little the check ins here and there, the Mets just felt very in control, which is something that we don't get a lot from Mets teams in general, but especially this Mets team, like just early from the jump, like you said, that one nothing with Beatty really did set the tone for this entire game. It made Allen Winnins uncomfortable, uncomfortable from the start, and the Mets jumped all over him, which I love to see. I love when this team gets aggressive because there are good hitters. These guys are good players. We've told you this all year. We're not just like, again, screaming into the void because we have a podcast. Ooh, we want you guys to listen and think we're always 100% right. Like there, there is proof and there is numbers and there are statistics behind this team being able to be a successful offensive lineup. And it just never stopped. Like the first top of the third inning of this game was seven nothing Mets. Like you had Brett Bay driving that one run the first inning, and then the second inning Jeff McNeil walked to start. And this was the first game where it really felt like Jeff McNeil was actually back in control yeah. of the strike zone. I got to up our boy Jordan, see what bad Jeff was using. We're yes, on we're on we're on knob watch for Jeff McNeil, but he walks, and then GJ Stewart and Harrison Bader make out because you know, eight nine hitters that's going to happen. And then just top of the order, Brandon will just laces a double, and you're like, okay, I can now see what we were thinking about earlier in the offseason where it's like if Jeff McNeil's hitting low, the lineup can flip over and the top of the lineup guys can drive him in. And it's just like, okay, 2 nothing. Al wins wild pitch, 3 nothing, And then you get to the third inning. Alvarez double. McNeil another double after uh, Alonzo singles lead off the inning. And DJ Stewart drops the hammer again. And hope, we're like, that's be the break, 7 nothing. And it's like, it, it, it again, you felt in control. This Allen Winnings is probably the, one of the worst pitchers the Braves have, but also the, this new iteration of the Braves. Not the most pitching anymore. Like, I don't know. Like, losing Spencer Strider for the year, again, sucks for baseball, sucks worse for the Braves. Now it's like you can kind of see a path to beating this team day in and day out where Charlie Moore's not the same guy. Max Fried does not look like the same guy. Who, I mean, Renaldo Lopez was the guy who kind of shut the mess down this series. So, uh, my bad hand up on missing that reverse jinx, but it's just we kind of have them. Most pitchers in this Braves team are not really instilling fear anymore. Yeah, how does how has Sale looked this year? I really haven't watched any of his appearances yet. How's he been, has he been okay? I think he looks good. I have him on a fantasy team. I haven't been keeping that close to tabs up, so I'm gonna I'm gonna find his ERA. Guess his ERA because I literally have no idea. Chris Sale, I don't know, th- three five. That's a pretty safe guess, loser. Uh, Chris oh, Sale's sorry. ERA is three three eight. Nice, not nice. bad. Nice. <laughs> that's it's not a safe guess. It's a good guess. That's a great but- guess. Yeah, and he also looks—he looks tremendous. He's striking guys' eyes, not walking guys anymore. The fastball velocity is average over ninety-five, which is crazy. Like he'll—he'll he'll wind up being the guy that saves his team, which is pretty hilarious. But it's a game where then, like, you now can relax when you have Jose Quintana facing his Braves team. And you're like, okay, like, nice. Like, let's just get through this because we have another game tomorrow, and let's just save the bullpen a little bit. And Quintana still couldn't get through the sixth inning, which is really frustrating given where this game was. And like guys like Chadwick Trump are like driving him in. We mentioned before yeah. every, everybody was hitting the ball hard, but it's just Trump twenty twenty four. Trump, Trump, right there. You gotta say the Trump, <laughs> Trump. Trump. <laughs> but I mean, hey, like and then Drew Smith comes in, mops it up again. Right, he's still zero ERA for the season. It's just, it was just fun to beat the Braves. It's, this series felt so really fun. good. It felt so really fun. good. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe we, maybe you got to be international, James. Maybe you need to be in a different continent. I need to be in Florida, Florida, Mark. And maybe that's what the vibes are. If we're too, too close to City Field, right? Before now that we're in different, different areas. Although I was. Still technically close to the Mets a little bit here. I wasn't too far away, actually. It was like seven hours. No, and again, like just talking about the lineup, everybody had a base hit at least. Everybody had a hard hit ball except for Jeff McNeil, who coincidentally had two hits, three RBIs, and two walks on base four <laughs> times, which is that's why I want Jeff McNeil to Jeff McNeil baseball. Brandon Nemo for the second time this series had three hard hit balls. Starling Marte, two hitter, had three hard hit balls. But also people say, we're talking about how good Starling Marte is playing right now. We'll do another guess. Guess his OPS. Uh, 584. He got up to 694, two hits today and a walk. But you're probably pretty close before the game. But again, Lindor got a hit, which we almost got that batting average to 100. We're around the we're on the up, we're coming up right there. But I don't know. It felt it felt a lot better. Now today, like the fact that McNeil had had his big game. I know Lindor has big game the other day and kind of basically won the Mets game on Saturday, Sunday. Right handed swinging. That's why. Yeah, I know. But I need I need one like really good lefty Lindor game to then be like this team is finally where I thought they would be. That and uh, maybe you know Luis Guillorme just serving up a grand slam as well. That that made the game look a little bit different too. But you know what? Fucking finally, how many times have the Mets had pitchers, position players come in against them and they don't do anything? They just do nothing. Tyrone Taylor. What does he love? Hitting position players. Luis Guillorme, grand slam to Tyrone Taylor. Absolutely love to see it. And you know what? As a Tyrone Taylor podcast, we're pro Tyrone Taylor here. Good ball player, baseball guy. Glad to see that he's padding the stats early on in the season because 
take a look maybe in uh, September, October, you're like, wow, Tyrone Taylor had a great little year and that Luis Guillorme Grand Slam could be the difference maker. It's also just, I, I, part of me really did feel bad for Luis Guillorme in that moment because he, I, you know, no, no, he got, the guy needed the job. We released him. He had to get a job. He didn't, he didn't leave the Mets willy nilly. He didn't sign a big contract with the Atlanta Braves. This, he could have still... played for the Chicago White Sox. He could have made the Rockies. I don't know. I just, it had to be like so dystopian for Luis Guillorme in that moment to be like, I've been on the other side of this so many times. How am I giving up Grand Slams? And now we're losing? Yeah. yeah. Am, I, am I the problem? <laughs> like, oh my God. But it's it, was, it, was, it's, it was just weird for the whole situation to flip. And then by the end of this, we just. Again, we beat the break. I, I, I hate like t- I hate like really celebrating a lot in April, but like the way no we felt, the way we felt ten days ago, this feels a lot different, and I'm really, really, really happy about it. Happy, happy feeling. We're not happy a week ago, not happy five days ago, whatever it is. It's just nice to see that the Mets are capable of playing the baseball that me and you both thought they were able to before the season started. Because for about a week, I was like, oh boy, were were we wrong? Were we were we Mets biased? Do we do we miss this? But I think they're going to be exactly what we thought, which is going to be stressful games. These games are going to be close. These games are going to be tight, but they have the ability to beat good teams like they did with the Atlanta Braves. And this is, I think, a huge series for the guys on the field, too, to be like, wow, we went into Atlanta without our best pitcher, without this, without that, and we were still able to beat them. That's huge. I think that's huge for the morale for a team that we know rides the highs and lows pretty tough, whatever it is. When they're high, they're high. When they're low, they're pretty damn low. So... And it's also just a mentality from just in baseball, just getting near 500 again. And when you start the season 0 and 5, you kind of run the risk of spinning out and spiraling like out. Like the Marlins. We're, yeah, we're seeing that with the Marlins right now. The Marlins look like they're going to have an all time bad season. There was an amazing clip that went around Twitter the other day with, um, yeah, good call by you. Um, Jazz Chisholm and Vidal Brujan were doing just a crazy dance in the dugout before a game at Yankee Stadium. And Josh Bell is standing there in shot, just looking like what the hell is going on right now? Do you guys know how bad we are? Why are you dancing like this? Like he had such an expressionless look on his face, such disdain. It was just I feel bad for a team like that. But again, again, God, they give I feel so bad. Oh, God. You gotta give a little bit of credit, I think, right now to Carlos Mendoza, a guy some people wanted wanted absolutely thrown off the thrown overboard a week ago. Definitely no one on this podcast was saying no, that. Never. No. But I think we 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 I think fairly criticize a couple of decisions that he made late game decisions lineup decisions bullpen decisions i think this Marte two hole thing is also still a very weird situation it's gotta die, it's gotta die. E- e- even though the Mets just scored 16 runs with him in the two hole so i mean it's gonna be hard for people people are gonna really tell us ready it's after this one but it's just to be a first time manager go zero and five after blowing two horrible extra inning games back to back and then win a really tight one and now string a couple of these together and then finally blow the doors off and win against your biggest rival presumably one of the best teams in baseball like that has to feel so good. And now you have a chance. I know the Royals team is playing, is playing good baseball and the Pirates team is playing good baseball, but you have a six-game homestand right now where you have only won one game this year, but the last one was one, where you could get yourself over 500 and then get ready for a West Coast trip that hopefully doesn't just kill you with going to, <laughs> going to Los Angeles and San Francisco. So is there more pressure knowing that that West Coast trip is coming, that it could be it could be dire dire days for the Mets and West Coast if like you, you got you got to kind of win some games here against the the Royals and the Pirates. I think you probably have to know that in the back of your head. And again, this, but this is the bounce back that we need this from this road trip of being zero and five and being like it because we said it a couple episodes ago. Like, imagine if the Mets are zero and nine heading to Atlanta because because yeah. it felt like that for half a second after that second Tigers game. Which again, that was us jumping the gun. That was us being reactionary and being just way too negative about this team. But that was us not working for the team anymore. We could. <laughs> yeah, we just we're just like we have to say things. I'm gonna yell. I'm gonna curse. I'm gonna scream. But. It's such a better feeling right now. Like you can actually breathe. Like being five and seven, it's like nothing has happened. You know what I mean? It's like the season. It's like there's no April. The baseball doesn't matter. Now it feels like it. you get out of April and you're fifteen and fifteen. You tip your cap, you salute, and you go on to May. Like that's where we have to be right now. I think that's what the team can get to. Maybe we were just a year late with our take. Like last year, we were like, God, we want this team to like be like two games under five hundred after April. We're like that would be great because they're too good in April all the time. We need to care less about April. Just play good enough baseball, and maybe this team just plays good enough baseball in April. Maybe that's not the worst thing. I was I was looking back at some of our um, TikToks and reels the other day because as you get, I've been on some long ass bus rides. I've just been like bored scrolling some stuff. So just um, I was looking back at that reel we did with Tim Healy where it was like, wow, the Mets vibes are so loose this spring, and I was like, damn. If this team wins sixty games, like maybe they were, maybe those vibes are a little too loose. Like I don't, we, maybe vibes should never be that loose again. But I was like, it's gonna sound stupid as fuck if this team's fifteen games under five hundred yeah. in June. But now you can kind of feel the looseness and the f- looseness and the fact that it's 
working and his team feels like they're having fun. Like DJ Stewart, like was what, like over for yeah, 70, yeah. over for 75 when he hit that home run. <laughs> no one cares. Just have another fun. home run again. Yeah. It was again. JD Martinez might never play. Who cares? Whatever. Yeah. Let's just play baseball. All right. Let's, let's talk about JD Martinez real quick. Cause we, we've been high. We've been high. We feel good. JD Martinez is seemingly not going to play in the month of April. It seems like. No, I have really bad vibes from this. Again, one it's letter terrible from, vibes. One letter different from Jed Lauer. I sent Mark a cursed image the other day that because I'm not going to be that much on social media these next few days. I'm going to the Sahara Desert. I'm going to camp a little bit. So, um, if if you find the moment for another update, I want you to throw that image out there because it's insane. I also pre-made the meme for this series. I never had to get used because it was a negative Mets meme. So I was really yeah, happy was about great. that. I love doing work that never happens, but I just the vibes around Jaden Martinez are bad right now. The fact that he Terrible wasn't signed. Weird a week before the major league season. And now he has body soreness and a back issue for a guy in his thirties. He got a cortisone shot. What has he been doing? What is this guy up to? <laughs> Why was he taking the at bats if he was in this much pain? I don't know. <laughs> I, it's, it's a weird situation. I'm not that thrilled about it at all, but I'm not going to overreact because I don't want to yet. And the vibes are too good with this team, but it'd be really nice to have JD Martinez playing baseball. Let's, let's give, it seems like this might just be old man. Just being like, I don't want to fly to the West coast. Maybe a Saturday, so, uh, Friday, April 27th, St. Louis Cardinals. My first game back in New York. Oh, maybe, maybe he's Martinez. just waiting for you to get back. That's what Maybe he is waiting for me to get back. I, I also, yeah. Apple TV game. He wants a national game. Two national games that series when I get back, which is insane. Uh, Friday night and then Saturday against the Cardinals, Apple and Fox. For, Ridiculous. For strong third place teams, let me tell you. I can't wait to watch those on national <laughs> TV. But bad vibes and other stuff Mets world that we've missed. I think it was just Kodai. Was there anything else that happened that we could be missing? I don't know. We've both been less on. Oh, 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 I got one. Uh, City Connect jersey revealed next Friday, and it oh, looks yeah, like they're yeah. going to be purple jerseys based on all the promo hype videos. Uh, they tweet out, like, if you know, you know, it's the Mets logo in purple. And someone was telling me that the Giants originally had purple in their jerseys back in the day oh. so it might be a little bit of homage to that along with the fact that the seven line being the main train it's a yes it's a set it's a purple seven what do you think do you think we're going to get full purple jerseys do you think we're going to get mets ish looking jerseys with purple instead of like blue i i actually really don't know what to expect shockingly haven't been any leaks yet every other city connect gets leaked the phillies awful one got leaked i'm interested to see what the mets one looks at i'll tell you this Excited though. Purple is a different color we don't see too often in baseball. These could be killer. These also could be, we're looking like Grimace out there out on the field. No, uh, I mean, I think it's the main color. I think the, I'm scared the main color is going to be purple. And you know my feelings on these City Connects, the too strong of a main color. I hate it's, but the full, it's like if we do purple jerseys, purple pants is going to be ridiculous. Purple pants is bad. Yeah. Purple, like, 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 like the, Barney. Like the Rockies jersey, amazing. Green, like green, green jersey, green white pants, outline. bad. Green pants, really bad. Uh, like a lot of these teams, like the Red Sox, yellow pants. It looks very strange. I think, no, uh, no yellow pants. They wear white pants. Okay, that's why that, that's why I like that one. Then I think there's another one. Who is it? Uh, maybe it's the Dodgers. Weird navy, deep navy Ooh, blue pants. Bad, strange. Yeah. But I'm trying to look at pictures right now of New York Giants purple jerseys. I'm seeing some like old schools with like like a just like a, a the red like it's like a the old school like 1930s uniform style yeah. that wool, that wool gray with just a purple and Y. That'd be kind of chill. I, I don't know. I'm I'm curious to see what this is. I feel like this could just I don't know. This could be really good or really bad. I don't think it's going to be in the middle. All we know, though, is that the old heads are going to hate it. No matter what, if you're over the age of, what are we going to set the line? 40, 47 and a half. I think you probably hate these jerseys. Go 41 and a half. 41 and a half. Okay. So the millenn yeah. millennials, basically millennials and under will like it, and everybody else yeah. will hate it. Yeah. And again, just eh, it's a little jersey talk, but I think it'll be, it'll be fun to have a City Connect jersey for better or worse. Let's something to talk about. I won't be buying it from America. That's all I know. Fuck no, THK all the way. I'm, I'm maybe uh, on your way back. Take a pit stop in China, pick up some jerseys, and then you know come back to the, the states. I've I've been looking for some Morocco soccer gear for you because I know you said you wanted it. Yes. They don't have it anywhere available. They, you know what they have? Madrid, AC Milan, Inter, Inter Milan, and then oh. all NBA. All NBA. I was in I was oh. in the cab. I was in the cab today, and I told the guy, I was like, "What's your name?" I was like, "James." He was a goth, like James Harden. I was like, "Yeah." This is specifically for Graham and Graham only, because I know he's at least a soccer fan. I, I want an Adele Tarop jersey. I want an El Tarop, Adele Tarop jersey. They're not going to have it. Or Yusuf El Arabi. Give me some of these guys. I'll check it out. But also, two sh more shout-outs to this from this series. Uh, Daniel Nunez and Tyler J. both made the Major yep. League debuts. We love that. Keep making Major League debuts, oh, guys. Keep working. Tyler J's Major League debut, former first-round pick. Yeah, 30th birthday, too. Whoa. Man, I didn't, uh, I didn't even realize. 
some very emotional words after the game. Really cool. Really cool for me. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it's a, it's a big deal for him. He, and again, first round pick. This guy was supposed to be, I believe, by the Twins, he was their first round pick. He was supposed to be a big deal. The big left handed, right? Left handed? He's lefty? I didn't watch the end of the game. It was 16 4, right. I'll be honest. Well, whatever. He was a big pitcher. <laughs> he was supposed to be great. Tyler J. Tyler J. John J. That's who I'm thinking of is like, I think John J. High School in New York, right? Maybe. I don't know. John Jay was also an outfielder for a very long time. This is going to be a little chaotic. Yeah, John Jay. Wow. Okay, let's talk about the prospects. We have a prospect report. I know James is seething to talk about Christian Scott, who just call call him up. Call him up. He's ready. Get him up here. We're it's just housekeeping stuff. We're going to do the prospect reports. We're going to make a thing. Every midweek episode prospect report. Every Monday episode, we're going to make fun of somebody's awful take in the baseball media world. So midweek episode, always come here for the prospect reports. Let us know. But Christian Scott, again, the Mets being rained out, um, just streaming some MILB in Morocco with some sicko shit. But, you know, I wasn't going to miss Christian Scott. Got to be the only person watching the Syracuse Mets in Morocco. <laughs> Have to be. Maybe in the entire continent of Africa. I guarantee there's one more person in Africa doing it, but I digress. I, I, I'll i push back on that. But, again, like the, the start of the season for Christian Scott is as good as we ever could have hoped for. Five innings, ten strikeouts, two hits, one walk, one earned run last night, picking up exactly where he left off Binghamton last year and the spring training this year. So now he's through two AAA starts, nine total innings, 19 strikeouts, and one walk. 19 strikeouts and nine AAA innings. That's a 54% strikeout rate and a 51% strikeout minus walk rate, which is just completely and Pretty clinically good. insane. It's Pretty good. I, I, we're getting to the point now where we said it's one of the last episodes in the offseason that I, I didn't think he was going to come up quickly, but there was a chance that he was going to just totally, totally push the Mets' hand. And Kodai Senga moving to the 60-day IL, the only thing it meant was that we got a tiny bit more 40-man roster flexibility. And Christian Scott is not in the 40-man roster. This is the opening where it's like if there's probably three or four more of these. So a guy gets Syracuse right when I get back from from the uh, the other side of the world here. Yeah, we gotta talk to Christian Scott because it could. I don't know. I'm start, I'm starting to think Memorial Day is the, the time. I'm really starting to think Memorial Day if everything keeps going well. We're not on TV or the newspaper, so I don't think we'll be allowed to get field passes to talk to those no. guys. But maybe not out in Syracuse, we got a shot. Yeah, maybe we have a shot. But the Wednesday start was all super encouraging from Scott because. We've seen a little from the spring training starts just because he's mostly like a fastball sweeper slider guy. He's a little susceptible against lefties. But he featured his changeup on Wednesday night in a Boston, I don't know, the Worcester Sox, like the AAA. The Red Woo Sox, Sox, yeah. The Woo Sox, yeah. Very lefty heavy lineup. Only half the lineup was lefties. So he was throwing that changeup, second most pitch thrown, only behind his fastball, and it graded out as an average pitch by Stuff Plus. Shout out TJ Stats. He's the new Stuff Plus guy on Twitter. He gets the graphic out there every day. Tons of graphics. He loves Christian Scott. Only three total hard hit balls. Again, 10 strikeouts in five innings. There were 13 whiffs. His forcing fastball, 13 or 15 called strikes, which I think is just pitcher hitters in AAA being like, that's 96. I'm not, that's not even worth swinging at. <laughs> I, I don't even do it. The one, home run he, the one run he did give up, though, was on a home run. Of uh, it was a fastball right down the middle. So yeah, you know, dip your cap for that one. It was who was it? It was someone who's been around the major leagues. It was oh, it was, it was such a weird backup infielder. Damn, I can't remember it now. I should have written Zhu Wei Lin. No, no, no. It was Sogard. I think it was Sogard. Eric Sogard is in the Red Sox org. Wow. It was either maybe his last name was Sogard, but it wasn't Eric. Maybe a Nick Sogard. I don't know. But funny as hell. But again, Christian's kind of amazing. Everything looks really good. So many clips went around because the Mets weren't playing. So every single Mets creator had to throw out the clips of Christian Scott. But the fastball looks amazing. The two sliders look good. Using the changeup against lefties is a great touch. Something he's need, going to need to do in the major leagues if he wants to be effective. Um, I'm over the moon excited for Christian Scott. Still, as I was, as I am, and as I will be. Let's keep it. Let's keep it with the Florida boys here because we've got Brandon Sprout's debut as well in professional baseball, right? Professional baseball yes. debut. Two mm -hmm. and two-thirds innings, five strikeouts, five walks. Don't love that, but... Debut. Maybe he's got maybe he's got some nerves. Maybe he's got some jitters. Maybe he was excited. But the idea is that five strikeouts and two and two thirds innings, that's what, almost every single out? Yes, yeah, basically. It is uh, every single out. No, seven. Two, two, nine. Oh, two. Yeah, yeah. Good math. Good math. Close. But uh, we're gonna talk about a couple cyclones in a row here being Sprout, uh, Nolan McLean, and Calvin Ziegler. And we should mention that these were all against the Astros high A team, the Asheville. Taurus, I think, which is an awful name, but an incredible team. Shout out to our buddy Nick LaRue. He is in Brooklyn right now working with this team. Neither Mark and I are here, so we're missing him, which is a real shame because he's the man. Uh, strength and conditioning for the Astro, for his Astro Sega high A team. But Luis Baez in that lineup, who's probably the most underrated prospect in baseball right now. It seemed like he was the guy the Mets might have wanted instead of Ryan Clifford last year, but the Astros were like, absolutely fucking not because this guy's a freak. Also, first round pick Bryce Matthews who was smashing the ball in the series. He's someone who's been like one of the most impressive minor leaguers early in the season, but we're talking Mets right now. Cool thing about Sprout in this was that he worked himself into and out of trouble a lot in this outing. He loaded the bases in this third inning before he got pulled, 
and he got two strikeouts before he left the game. So he ne- he bared down, nailed it down. We're not gonna have a lot of data on these guys in Brooklyn just because Haye doesn't have Statcast, but we're gonna pick and piece what we can do. And we did some good. I did some good picking and piecing on Nolan McLean, who also made his Brooklyn debut. Uh, what are you doing? What are you scratching? I've, are you, got, are you? I've, I, I've got salt on my neck. Where did I get salt from? All over go, my neck. You should go to the beach. I mean, like I, I was took a trip to the beach a little bit in the sand traps today, but I don't. There's just a lot of salt on me. <laughs> I I can't even salt. I I don't, I don't even know what to say about that. You got salt on you. <laughs> Nolan McLean, three and a third innings, three hits, no earned, one walk, two strikeouts, also two hit by pitches <laughs> with less than four innings of work for the Cyclones. But longest outing as a Met in the Mets organization. He was just a couple tiny little relief appearances last year, only faced a handful of batters each time. So now as he transitioned to being a starter full time, there's probably going to be some growing pains, which will be two hit by pitches in three and a third innings. But again, this is a really good Astros lineup. And the fact he didn't give up an earned run, got a few swings and misses and the fastball and the slider look so good. They look so ridiculously good. Like that mix right now, I'm not even being hyperbolic here. Nolan McLean could be a major league reliever with those two pitches. I'm not even kidding. I think he'd be a plus major league reliever right now. I think he could, I think he could be basically what Drew Smith is, which you might think that's being disrespectful to Drew Smith, but really that's just with how good those two pitches are from Nolan McLean. We're developing at the start, though. We're going to take the long way here. And he was throwing a lot of colors in this appearance. And that color is going to be vitally important because if you're just throwing a fastball and a sweeper, you need another pitch that's either going to get you soft contact, one you could throw to the lefties, and one that can exist in the strike zone and not get killed. Astros hit a lot of hard hit balls in this game, a lot of hard hit balls. I watched like a full video recap of a shout out Prospect Health on Twitter. He, he's been he's been hand tracking a lot of these pitching performances. He was watching every Brooklyn Cyclones game this week. He's a, he's a great Twitter follower. He's doing whiffs. He was doing hard hits. He's the man. But they were crushing it. But that cut fastball as he develops, because that's the new pitch he's working on right now, that's going to be what gets Nolan McLean to really actually becoming a starter, which is a really cool thing. All right. And then we got Calvin Ziegler as well. Four innings, nine strikeouts, only one hit. No, no hits, no hits, no walks, no runs, nine strikeouts in his debut in Brooklyn. And he, I know you wrote this down in the notes as Blake Tidwell's the forgotten man a little bit here, but Ziegler's kind of the forgotten man because he was a second round pick back in what what year was that? Was that the twenty? 20- that was the Christian Scott Mike Vassell draft twenty the okay. first the first day Steve Cohen draft twenty twenty one. Gotcha. Yeah, so twenty twenty one. He's kind of the forgotten man because he was someone that you were particularly high on because he had all the like plus mechanics plus stuff, the low release angle uh, from like a little bit of a shorter guy. But I think he's had some injuries, didn't throw a lot of innings. Looks like this year is going to be the year that you hopefully see Ziegler take that next step and nice strikeouts in four innings again. Not too shabby, this Mets pitching lab here. All of a sudden, I mean, there's there's a guy at the end that you guys have probably never heard of that Jim's going to talk about. He's been sending himself tweets on Mets stuff Twitter. Just And I'm like, what is going on here? Like, just leave him. I need this for the podcast. I'm doing research. But the Mets pitchers are getting so many swings and misses at the ma- minor league level. Totally. And I don't want to forget about these guys. And also just, again, just being away, like definitely not as much on the social media grind as we usually are, but going to probably start doing a like weekly series from Mets up Twitter, just as we try to get over the 10,000 follower mark, where I'm just going to do crazy threads about Mets prospects having good weeks because people love prospect talk. And people love Twitter threads. I'm kind of good at them. So I'm going to start rolling that. But this Calvin Ziegler start was like literally as good of a start as you could ever have as a, as a pitcher in any level, just no hits, no walks, nine strikeouts, four innings, like that's disgusting. And the four innings thing, a lot of these Mets people are probably going to talk about the fact that a lot of these outings have been very small by these guys, but we're getting built up. It's April. And Ziegler himself, he only threw one inning all of last year as he was battling bone spurs and bicep tendonitis. So even him throwing four innings for this team and being legit perfect when he was doing it, massive, massive mentally. It's massive for development. It's massive for everything. And he had eight straight strikeouts in the middle of this outing. Eight straight players came to the plate, struck out against Calvin Ziegler. His fastball sat 94 to 96. His curve was fucking crazy. The video's on again. Guys, look up Prospect Tilt. He had great videos of this. 13 whiffs on 53 total pitches. And just so, so glad to see him healthy. Because he had such a weird track to the draft in the majors anyway. He was a Canadian, but he couldn't. MLB scouts couldn't go to Canada then because of the COVID rules, travel rules still. So we transferred to a prep school in Florida that only does baseball. Like they barely even do school from what it seems like to me. I think it's called like the Heritage School or something. You know, and that just so scouts could see him and he actually got drafted in that draft because of it. And then immediately dealt with injuries. And now he's finally back stronger. He looks bigger. He looks healthier. And he looks like someone who we should probably be getting very excited about as Mets fans. Definitely. We have mentioned Blade. Blade also looked really good. Five and two thirds, five strikeouts, no earned runs. He's a guy who I think you're probably just going to, you know what he is. You know what you're going to get out of him. He's going to be very solid. He might not have these crazy highs that you see of Christian Scott or Calvin Ziegler with the nine strikeouts and four innings, but he seems like he's just going to be a pretty good pitcher in this organization. You need, I don't want to call him oatmeal. That's disrespectful to him, but you need a little bit of that at times. Meat and potatoes. Meat. Oh yeah. Dude, Blade Tidwell probably loves meat and potatoes. 
I mean, I love meat and potatoes. You love meat and potatoes. Who doesn't love, love meat and potatoes? Animals. No, animals love meat and potatoes too, probably. <laughs> just had meat and potatoes for dinner. And I, you know what I want to do tomorrow for dinner? Meat and potatoes. How's the, the Moroccan best. meat? Moroccan meat, it's slow cooked meat. It's called the tagine. They they smoke Ooh. it in this little like thing every every that's like that's like the main meal here. That or chicken skewers, which never, never miss. No, never. But heavy meat diet, really enjoying it. Also just like I know guys, people don't want to talk about the personal stuff. Too bad. Get over it. If you've gotten this far in the podcast, you probably just you like, like us, us a little bit anyway. Yeah. Walking around this place is like nothing I've ever seen in my life. Like the town square, there were snake charmers, there were monkeys on leashes, like doing what? backflips for money, like people trying to sell you everything. Like haggling is such a thing here, like nothing I've ever experienced. I, I'm doing this outside of my hotel, so I'll whisper into the microphone. I haggled for my hotel. I went on WhatsApp wow. before I came here and I offered the guys cash, USD, and they gave me like 40% off nice. the hotel. Nice. I don't want to say it too loudly, but yeah, they did that. Anyone trying that. to go to Morocco, there's a little tip for you. Insane. Like, and also, like, the people are like aggressive about selling stuff too. Like, the women in, the t- in that square who are trying to sell henna tattoos, they'll grab your hand and start the tattoo and make you pay. Ooh, don't like that. Bad, bad, bad vibes. I was don't bad like vibes. that. But, I also don't like henna. I don't know what it is. It creeps yeah. me out. I also, again, I'm not very privy to the Muslim calendar. Of, of course not. I happen to be here during the height of Ramadan, Eid Mubarak, <laughs> nice. uh, to, all, to, all the, to all the Muslim listeners out there. So <laughs> walking around trying to find restaurants the first few days of the trip, they're all closed because you can't eat. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a mess up, but uh, it was fun. It was, it was it's just cool. I don't, I've never been to like a non-Christian denominational country. So like being here has been fascinatingly interesting. It's just interesting people. Everyone speaks French and 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 Arabic, but also some English and a little bit of Spanish. It's, it's, it's a very weird mix, but some crazy food. Also, no alcohol. Muslim, no alcohol. Yeah, no alcohol. Yeah. No alcohol at all. So Sorry, your body could use it. I'm feeling clean right now, too, after a week of drinking wine in Italy, and the next week I'm going to be drinking wine in Spain. But this is such a ridiculously insane place. But oh, also something really cool I texted you about. They just they love soccer here. So Champions yes. League, uh, semifinals, I think it was. Or quarterfinals. Semifinals, I think it was semifinals. Yeah, quarterfinals, I think. We're, I don't know. We played the other night, and it was, it was Madrid, Munich, um, Arsenal, and I think Man City were the four teams playing. I don't remember the matchups. Every single cafe, as far as the eye could see, Old men sitting outside watching Champions League. Locked in. And, and there's no alcohol. People are just sitting watching sports and smoking Sober. cigarettes. Sober. <laughs> just, just watching sports. It's, it, it was really cool. It was just really cool to see like how deeply invested like people in this country are. Because there's no, there's no Moroccan League. There's no Moroccan no. champion team. There's only a few like high-level players. Like you said, Adel Tarat and someone else who I don't know. But just cool to see like sports obsession in a country that I wasn't really expecting it. Yeah, no, Morocco, Morocco's actually got a very good national team. That's why I'm shocked they're not yeah, selling they these good. jerseys anywhere. They're very good. I haven't seen any. I, I, I literally, I'm seeing Madrid. I'm seeing Lakers. I'm seeing Bucks. Like, I'm seeing You Rockets. know the colors to keep an eye out for? It's like a dark yeah, it's a red, red, red and yellow, green. Yeah, gold. And the gold, no, right? It's a green, green. Okay. I'll keep an eye out yeah, for it again. Keep an eye out for it. This weekend. But, but you know who else was cool? <laughs> tell me. Jonah Tong. Jonah Tong. Talk about him, James. Mets fans. Jonah Tong is like the new sleeper prospect in the system, pitcher wise. We also saw Wyatt Hulipol, who who's still in the backfield, so we don't get that much data on him, but he's still my guy. Jonah Tong, guys. Jonah Tong. Four and a third innings for St. Louis. Two hits, no runs, two walks, 11 strikeouts. 11 strikeouts. Four and a third innings is 13 outs, and 11 of them were punchies. It's ridiculous. And again, he's pitching in Port St. Lucie. And for some reason, StatCast, we have data in AAA and we have data in low A. So every Jonah Tong star, we're going to have data for. His curveball was getting 65 inches of drop in this. That is max free Jude Darvish levels of drop on a curveball. Whoa. And his fastball had 20 inches of inverted vertical break. The pure rising action. Those two as a combination is like, like he's a smaller guy. So we don't know how his body's going to stand up to workload. But that's legit ace stuff right there. And I'm not going to call him an ace, but I'm just saying like as a single A prospect, that's as good as you could ever want. And again, shout out guy TJ Stats. He's doing every, it's as any pitcher in the world with Sackcast data. He's doing stuff plus for it. Plus plus on the fastball and the cutter. And not the curveball, which is weird because it has so much drop, which I think just might – some models are weird sometimes. You never know. But – He's going to be so fun to track Port St. Louis this year with David. He'll probably, we'll probably get to Brooklyn at some point, but this Brooklyn rotation is stacked with Ziegler, Dolan McLean, and Brandon Spro. We got a pitching listen, lab, baby. Listen, if you're trying to take another trip to Florida, uh, you know I'll never say no. So if you want to go down to Port St. Louis, you catch a game, talk to Jonah Tong. You know, you know I will hop out of plane instantly. Yeah, that would have been something cool to do when we were with the Mets, go to Port St. Louis and talk to a bunch of prospects. That would have been nice, but yeah, not us, yeah. not for us. There's no, another show. But, yeah. yeah, but again, a lot of exciting Mets prospect stuff. Next week, maybe if it's not an exciting week of pitching, I'll talk, talk more about, about it. Talk more about some bats. But this was just there were so many good pitching performances this week. I had to tell you guys about them because we should be really excited about the Mets. Kind of maybe building a bit of a pitching factory here. Kind now, of a little I, bit. 
I got to ask you, what is Manchester Baseball Club Tim? I see this All in right. the notes. I don't know what this is. <laughs> this is a funny one. So I, I told you guys that I'm going to start going through the Instagram and getting to a lot of DMs because we didn't answer a DM for like a year because we didn't use the We're Instagram for like a year. Hollywood. Yeah. So um, I just went through was answering a bunch of people's DMs. So shout out to guy Tim. She said shout out to Manchester Baseball Club. Just funny. This podcast has a connection to Manchester, England. Yeah, just just one connection, right? I would say. <laughs> I think just exactly one connection, Manchester, exactly England. Exactly one. Yeah. Shit. That's it. And I told Tim says he's going to be in London for the series. I said you're going to be there, so I'm fifty fifty. But maybe we'll get a beer with you, Tim. Go to the pub, get a yeah. pint. I'll get a beer with you at the absolute worst. Yeah, worst case scenario. But now, as we say goodbye to you guys, we've got a nice, fun series preview with the Royals. Going to wrap this one up and pitching matchups here. This was a great moment for the Luis Severino um, propaganda because yeah. He went from a start in Atlanta to a start at home against the Royals. And the Royals swing in a hot bat. We'll say that. But Friday night, ace off, Luis Severino versus Michael Waka. Saturday, Sean Manaya versus Alec Marsh. And then Sunday, another ace off, uh, in, in homage to Dwight Gooden's number being retired, Jose Budo versus Cole Reagans. Oh, ace off and ace, ace off, off and a half there. Yeah, the Royals are playing really good baseball. I think they just won the series against the Astros. They're currently eight and four, maybe nine and four. I don't know if baseball reference updated the wins and the stats yet, but Bobby Witt Jr. is one of the best players in baseball. MJ Melendez looks like a really, really good hitter. And for those of you who are watching the second half of last season, he did this for like 80 games. So this isn't fake. He is a very, very good baseball player. Nelson Velasquez has not stopped hitting and Salvador Perez is drinking from the fountain of youth. He's been a phenomenal hitter from the start of the year. So they still have some weird guys in there like Adam Frazier plays. I don't know why he's in the lineup. Kyle Isbell is pretty awful, but he throws like 99 from center field. And Hunter Renfro is, uh, he turned 32 this year. He looks like a 45-year-old man. He looks horrendous. But this is a fun little Royals team. This is not a walkover, kind of like you think the Tigers were and they showed you that they play good baseball. I think the Royals are going to show you that they're a good baseball team very much in this series. As much as we talk about Adam Frazier, Two years in a row, he's been on the American League trendy, sexy breakout team, being the Mariners, and then last year, the Orioles. It's true. So if Adam Frazier goes three for three, we just might have to anoint him the best locker room guy in the history of the American <laughs> in the American League, because he's that guy. But it's a new Todd about, Frazier. Literally, you talk about Bobby Witt right now. Bobby Witt right now has a 755 slugging percentage. 755. And his ex-slugging, you know what it tells you? He's actually getting unlucky. 800 wow. ex-slugging percentage right now. His average exit velocity is 99.4 miles an hour. When a ball hits Bobby Witt's bat, the average velocity it leaves at is 99.4 miles an hour. That's his average. His barrel rate is 27%. That average exit velocity, that X slug, that barrel rate, and his 71% hard hit rate are all the best in baseball right now early in the season. He's 23 years old. He just got paid. He looks like he's becoming probably one of the four or five best players in the entire league. And I'm saying that not even lightly, like he's that good. And he's leading the charge. Got too. I got Bobby Wood Jr. cards I've been sitting on and I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to move. Anybody interested, hit me up. There you <laughs> go, baby. But this Royals team like led by Wit at the top is a team that is just ready to roll. And you kind of see them as someone who in the off season kind of gave their team a stamp of confidence. We're like, we're going to spend a little bit of money right now. And we're, we think you guys are ready to do something where we're going to sign Seth Lugo. A little sad we're not seeing Seth Lugo this series. He just he had a great start against the Astros on Wednesday. But we're going to sign Seth Lugo. We made the big trade for Cole Reagans last year, and he's a stud. We're going to sign Michael Waka. This doesn't sound that sexy. This doesn't sound that cool. But it's like, you know what we're going to do? Like we're going to try and win baseball games. Our division sucks, and we're going to we're going to get we're going to throw down and play some ball. It's also just 12 games in April. Last year the Pirates were what, like 17 and 11 or something. Then they wound up 15 games under 500. So a lot can still happen, but this Royals team is fun. I'm going to tell a lot of Mets fans, watch out for Cole Reagans. If you haven't watched a Cole Reagan start, you're going to, you're going to look at him and be like, is this, is this, is this lefty Jacob DeGrom? Because he just, he has an exploding fastball. He's got, I mean, again, it's not, I'm being, I'm being hyperbolic right now, but he's got a crazy fastball. He's got a sick changeup, a color, a slider, a curveball. He throws five pitches, at least 10% of the time. He's gassing 98, 99 miles an hour with the fastball. He's a freak of nature. You're going to be astounded watching a pitch on Sunday. And hopefully a lot of people are at the park on Sunday because we're retiring Doc Gooden's number. Yes, Have go, to say, go support Doc. Go support Doc. It's bizarre. The Mets are retiring his number on a Sunday. So I weird. thought that was a weird move. I think that kind of feels like they're trying to get people into the gate in April, but also similar to when the Super Bowl is at MetLife Stadium. The, the the gods have smiled upon us. It looks like it's going to be 60 and sunny, so everybody Perfect that can way. be there, get out there. Are you, are you going to go Sunday? Uh, no, I will not. I'm not able to go there Sunday. I might be going Friday after I land off the plane. I might be going Saturday <laughs> because they're giving away a bobblehead Saturday. And now that I can actually go into the stadium and get the bobbleheads, I kind of want one. Yeah, right. I love bobbleheads. Bobbleheads are fun. But this Royals team is going to be really annoying because they could hit the shit out of the ball. And like Michael Garcia is the breakout player in this team. He's someone that 
the fancy baseball players, the ball knowers went to the season being like, there's going to be a guy. Ronald Acuna's cousin, I'm almost positive on. He's, he's hitting so well. He has almost as many pro- pulled barrels through two weeks of the season as he had all of last season combined. He just, he's and hitting still a, got the pass watch too. He's a great ball player too. Yes, he finally has breakout game on Wednesday, but he has kind of come out of the gate slowly and he's kind of showing his his limitations as a baseball player, just being like a 15 homer first baseman, but puts the, puts the bat on the ball a ton. He's also a Jersey guy or Long Island guy, one of the two, I can't remember. So I'm sure he's going to have a huge constituency of family and friends at these games this weekend, which is cool because I like Vinny Pasquantino, Italian beef. He's, he's a hell of a ball player, but... Crazy fun Royals team. Really fun. Watch out for James McArthur in the bullpen. The few games they have lost because Will Smith has blown them. James McArthur has much better stuff than Will Smith. Good, not great, though, but he's stepping in for closer. Carlos Hernandez in his bullpen, one of my favorite levers in the league. He'll just heal gas 102. 99, yeah. Yeah. I Again, this team's playing well, but they're super beatable. If the Mets can win a third series, a series in a row, like if suddenly it's fucking on. We're cooking with oil then. Uh, for those of you at home who like to gamble, we know uh, steal bases against the Mets. You can win free money. Right now, Dyrone Blanco leads the team in stolen bases. He has four plate appearances, five stolen bases. So if he gets in the lineup, bet him to steal. And then the other guys, Bobby Witt's going to steal at least one this series. Michael Garcia steals. Kyle Isbell steals. It's just guys get on base. They're probably going to be running. This is a team that is aggressive on the base pass as well. I also didn't even realize this. We're always riding a seven-game win streak. They just swept the Astros. Oh, they swept them. Wow. A seven-game win streak after winning one out of two against the um the Orioles. So watch out for the hot Royals, but let's 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 defend City Field. Let's get some wins in their home ballpark and let's celebrate Doc Gooden. Defend the city. That's that we already came with a better slogan than these months. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it took it took three seconds. It took two, came two, really off yeah. the top of my head. But happy retiring Doc Gooden Summer. Much deserved. He's probably the, the he's definitely the second best pitcher, second or third best pitcher third. in Mets history. Third best, second most influential. Give me that. Yes. Okay, yeah, and deal. it seemed like the Wilpons kind of held a grudge against him for doing a lot of drugs. I I, I see that, but also kind of just having and having a lot of success with the Yankees. But I'm really happy that one of the all-time greatest organizations being honored. Howie Rose and the MC is going to be legendary, and lucky for the Mets that they got 60 and sunny instead of 45 and rainy. And Dwight looks like he's really, really happy. He looks so happy. happy. I'm like, so this happy. Is like for the him. most important thing for him. Yeah, he's gone through a lot. Happy to see this. He he's talked about how when the Mets told him they were going to do it, like he thought it was a prank phone call at first. Yeah, which is so sad, but also like he was he was spurned from this organization for so many years, and he's such an important part of it. And it's just it's it's terrible what the Wilpons did to him, and it's really nice that he's being welcomed back with open arms. Now he's like doing things with the team again, especially yep. top of that, getting his number to the rafters where it belongs. Yep. Shout out to Dwight Gooden. Shout out to you guys for listening and making it this far in the episode. If you have, make sure you follow us on our social media at Mets Up on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Subscribe to the Mets Up podcast YouTube channel if you want to see the video version of this. Again, James in Morocco, me in Florida. If you like what you're listening to, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download it, and subscribe. Uh, James, what's your Twitter? James underscore Shiano. And I'm Giraffe Nick Mark with a C. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Peace out, guys. Peace out. See you next time. Go, Doc.